Hi guys, we're going to talk about intravenous therapy in this lecture. Um, so here we go. So um, nursing managing of uh, management or ma nursing managing IV therapy. So in doing that, we have to include assessment, intervention, evaluation, and documentation of uh, the fluid the site and its condition or assessment, site care, any that we do or need to do, prevention and treatment of any complications related to insertion and preservation or usage, and we need to maintain any equipment which, such as the fluid, the tubing, and the pumps that are used to administer the fluids. So some indications for use of IV therapy. One would be to draw blood generally you're going to see um, we draw blood from um, a patient who has a peripherally inserted central catheter or a PIC or a central venous catheter or a CVC. We use IV therapy um, to, and we're talking about peripheral IV therapy here. We will have a lecture devoted to central um, catheters and at that time we'll delve a little bit deeper into PIC lines and CVC lines. So we choose IV therapy because we need to administer fluids, replace electrolytes, certain medications, blood or blood products, nutritional supplements such as TPN, or often sometimes we might just need access available the, to keep it open. This might, you might see venous locks, heparin locks, saline locks. All of those refer to the same thing. They're just different terms used um, by different nurses or different facilities. So some benefits is um, we can give uh, medication and nutrition to clients who can't take things orally. We can uh, help maintain fluid balance or give fluid replacement. It provides access in emergencies. It is the only route available for unconscious patients. Medications get a faster absorption and distribution rate. Um, it saves time for nurses. This was listed as one of the benefits and it can help us get a more accurate assessment of a patient's intake. Some risks, discomfort or anxiety, infiltration or displacement, infection, thrombus, embolism, fluid overload, rapid medication overdose, patients can have hypersensitivity, and there is a risk of transmission of bloodborne diseases. So when we actually institute IV therapy, there are two categories of IV solutions crystalloids and colloids. Crystalloids are divided um, based on their tonicity, which we talked about in the fluid and electrolyte lecture, and they can either be hypotonic, isotonic, or hypertonic. And then there are colloid solutions, and these contain protein or starches, and um, these help either keep fluid in the vascular system or help pull fluid from tissues back into the um, vascular system based on changes in uh, pressures within the vascular system. So this is a chart um, showing some different types of isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, uh, what we might use those fluids for, and any special considerations if you were to use those fluids. So we have to talk about intravenous sites. So before we ever put an IV in a patient, we need to determine if we're going to use a peripheral vein or a larger, more central vein. And so we determine what is the purpose for the IV therapy or the need for the site and how long is the patient going to need the therapy. We also look at the patient's age, current diagnosis, why are they in the hospital, health history, and the overall conditions of their veins. And we also look at hydration status. And we want to use um, the least invasive that we can for the patient. It is recommended if you can, the most distal that you can go. We want to avoid uh, areas that show active bruising or phlebitis. We need to review the skin. We do have layers of the skin that we're gonna go through first before we ever reach the vein. And this is just a simple review of the skin. And we know that our veins are located within the subcutaneous tissue. Next, we need to look at our veins, a simple review of the veins. Veins have three layers. It is in the inner layer that we find blood flow. It's where the valves are. 
and we have to get through uh, the first two upper layers to reach this inner layer and that's where the IV catheter will be placed is in the tunica intima. This is a picture of uh, veins that are in our arms and hands. This picture is a little bit more um, informative about the upper arm veins. Generally, we use these upper arm veins if we're going to put a pick in or a peripherally inserted central catheter. We will put a central line in the subclavian vein or the internal jugular vein. So how do we choose? It needs to be individualized to the patient. It's related. It's influenced by the client, the age, purpose, type, length, and assessment of the site choices, physician, and, and client preference. Sometimes the physician tells us where he'd like to have it, and based on the, the uh, size of IV he'd like placed in, that can limit some of our choices of where we'll be able to place it. Sometimes clients don't want um, IVs in certain places um, and we have to respect those preferences of the client unless we're that is absolutely the only place we can put it. So there are types of venous access devices. Um, there are needles over the needle catheter, inside the needle catheter. These are rarely used. You can have subcutaneous infusion ports or subcutaneous pumps. Um, what we're going to talk about and what you'll practice with is the over-the-needle catheters. This is kind of an idea of what they look like in terms of length and size. Uh, this is generally a 20 gauge. This will be, no, 18, 20. Okay, pink is 18, blue is 20, yellow is 22 in this picture. You can see that as the diameter of the needle gets um, uh, smaller it does have a higher number it's also a little bit shorter in length and so that's good to keep in mind um, so when our fluid in, in requires a placement of a venous access device into a peripheral or central vein but we're going to talk about into a peripheral vein um, we can locate them on the extremities they're generally used for short-term therapy and we want to use them when patients have healthy veins and when relatively non-irritating fluids are given. You can use a wing tipped and I'll show you a picture in just a minute. It's just a short needle with two plastic wings on the end that are held during the insertion. We have the over the needle so uh, the it retracts into a rigid chamber at the catheter hub after insertion and a small plastic tube fits over the needle and then we insert that little plastic catheter into the vein and withdraw and the needle is withdrawn after insertion. So this are two pictures of um, a wing tipped IV. These are not used on adult patients uh, very often. Often it is the best choice for pediatrics and occasionally in the elderly, although they may uh, infiltrate easily. You can see they have a very short needle. This here is what looks like the common over the needle. I'm sorry the picture is upside down like that, but we will get your hands on these in lab as soon as we finish with our one hour hands-on demonstration on Monday and we'll be practicing these. They're the most commonly used they range from a 24 to a 26 and the needle length is one half to one and one quarter inches. The needle um, is removed after insertion and it's the plastic sheath that overlays the needle that stays in the vein. Um, and they, are, they may be com they're comfortable, more comfortable to the patient. Uh, some disadvantages is, as with any IV therapies, it could restrict the patient's activity and it may be difficult to insert. There are picks, there are tunneled catheters, and there are subclavian or interjugular CVCs, and um, this is a brief definition of what they do, and we will talk more about these specifically with, in great detail when we talk about our central line day in about three or four weeks. 
So we do need to prepare a patient psych psychologically. Uh, we need to realize that for some patients this might be a new experience. For others, they may have had previous uh, unpleasant experiences. We've all had or heard of the patient who says, I'm a terrible stick, nobody can ever get me. Um, so they may have their own view of how they think it's going to go. Um, they might have had some current health status changes and be in personal crisis related to illness or what's going on. And the initiation of IV therapy can only can add to that stress in the patient already. So um, we need to do some patient teaching um, to help adapt the patient to the stressful situation. We need to explain the positive effects on the initiation of IV therapy. Um, it will help the venipuncture be smoother if we can get the patient um, relaxed. But always remember, being stuck with any needle is unpleasant experience for just about everybody. So some ways to decrease, decrease the stress is kind of talk in a calm and clear manner. Be short and to the point about what you're going to do, why we need to do it, perhaps how long the IV needle will be there. Um, and talk about that, you know, they are going to feel some discomfort when it's put in. Um, some places encourage pain, uh, localized pain medication to be given that can always be offered to the patient. Always allow the patient time if there is to ask any questions because um, that can help develop that trusting relationship between you and the patient. I know in emergencies perhaps there isn't going to really be time to have a lot of conversation with questions. But be sure you address them after the emergency is over for the patient if they were to have any. So what equipment do we need? Will we need the IV catheter? We'll need a tourniquet. We can use alcohol or a skin cleansing solution. Um, we need tape or dressing gloves. If we're going to hang IV right away, you know, gather your tubing, your solution, and a pole and your infusion pump so that when you go in the room, to be with the patient, you have everything that you need to accomplish the IV insertion. So we want to be sure that we select the most least restrictive and the largest vein that is in the best condition. Nice, soft, straight veins are the best. Avoid veins that are hard or bumpy, bruised or swollen, or near a previously infected area or close to a site that was recently discontinued. Um, sometimes they'll have to use ultrasound to locate the veins if we're having a hard time. Prefer not in the non-dominant arm if possible. And we never do it in an arm that has impaired or poor circulation or poor lymphatic drainage. And we never do it on the site where a patient has had a history of a radical mastectomy, third edema in that area, or history of third degree burns. So what do we do? We wash our hand, perform hand hygiene, we verify the order, we identify the patient, we check for allergies such as to betadine, latex, or tape. We want to explain the procedure, apply the tourniquet above the distal site to locate um, where you're going to put it, do your assessment, make your site choice, and then remove the tourniquet. Okay, then we're going to clean the area where we're going to put the venipuncture, circular pattern. Okay, we're going to allow that to air dry. And then we're not going to blow on it or use a fan. Okay, and then we'll make sure our equipment is assembled and ready to go. And then we'll reapply the tourniquet. And then we're going to perform the venipuncture. And in performing the venipuncture, you carefully insert the cannula through the skin and guide it into the vein. And we do that in the direction of blood flow. So we're coming up towards the heart, up towards the head with our attempt. Um, if your first attempt is unsuccessful, then we just select another site, get a new cannula, and we try again. Okay. We're going to be using over the needle, and so the needle sticks out a little bit from the plastic um, sheath that we're going to leave in place. So we go through the skin with the needle, and usually once we hit, get, hit the vein, we're going to see what's termed a flash of blood will appear in the hub. That will tell us that we're in the vein. At that point, we are not going to advance the needle anymore, but we are going to slide the plastic sheath down the needle into the vein. Okay, 
and we will visually see this when we meet Thursday at morning. Here's kind of um, a few schematics, kind of how to hold the over the needle catheter, um, the angle at which they're getting hitting the vein, and then just a little bit about how it kind of goes into the skin. And then now we're getting into the vein for you to see. After threading the cannula, we're going to put it into the thing. We'll either connect the infusion tubing and set our pump, okay? Or we will connect a hub of a venous lock, okay? And then flush the site. Either way, you want to make sure that uh, all things that you're going to connect to that cannula have been flushed and it's ready to go. We, some people will tape it securely without circulation. Some people will put a small amount of tape just right over the tip of the thing to kind of hold it in secure while we're turning things off to twist off and change out. Um, and then at the very end, once things get going, we are going to put a clear occlusive dressing over it. And the reason we use clear occlusive is that it allows for the most accurate assessment of the site because we can see the site um, every time we go in there. There is pain, um, so there are some drugs that can decrease the pain. Some places use uh, intradermal lidocaine. Um, some might use um, Emilog cream or Emila cream, which is a lidocaine cream that you place on the skin for about 10 or 15 minutes before the insertion, and it will um, numb the surface of the skin and just a little bit below. What do we document? Well, on the IV site itself, we're going to put, there's usually a little piece of tape or label that we'll put our initials, the date that we put in. Um, we're also going to come back to our chart and we're going to put uh, the size, the placement, and we also do how many attempts we made, patient, how they tolerated it, and we will label every, all bags of fluid with what it is, who the patient's name is, and the rate. We'll also put on the tubing the date and the time that we initiated that tubing because many policies, hospitals have policies of how often tubing changes need to occur. So now we're going to talk about infusions. So um, of the actual fluid itself. I'm losing my mouse. So um, if we're going to uh, hang an infusion we want to gather and assemble our equipment we want to make sure we have the right solution and we want to make sure when we look at that solution we're looking for clarity no leaks in the bag and no contamination and that it hasn't expired so then we're going to need to go in and set our flow rate so these are some things that might affect um, infusion rate height of the fluid um, how high you set the pole um, if you're going to do, um, so let's say you do drip rate rather than a pump. Um, if someone comes in and changes the height of your pole, then you've got to readjust your drip, drip rate because it will go faster. If they lower your pole, it will go slower. Um, uh, vo fluid of volume in the container, um, and then how thick it is. We also want to assess the site. Is it patent? Is it red? Is it swollen? Is it painful? So here's some things that might impact flow rate. Um, and it is our responsibility to ensure that the IV infuses at the ordered rate which is why I, I'm going to say the majority of places uses pumps because they are the most accurate way to uh, get the volume in. So here's some other factors that can affect in your infusion rate, cannula diameter, venting of the fluid container, um, and position of the extremity. So sometimes we have to calculate the infusion rate so we always determine how much fluid is to be given in an hour increment. 
Um, so most pumps are set by the hour, hourly rates. When we do other things, we set them in hourly rates. So we look at the order. And then um, if we have to calculate by drops, we look at how many drops equal a mil in the delivery set, which is called the drip factor. And the, 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 thing, the tubings will tell us what their drip factor is. Um, so macro drop sets either deliver in 10 or 15 or 20 drops. And I know you guys have been working on some dosage calculations. So this may make a little more sense to you. And we'll do some dosage calculations also on Thursday in class. Um, so we got to know the rate and we use the roller clamp and some still have screw clamps. It's a gravity infusion and we adjust the rate by counting the number of drops in a minute. Um, we check these way more frequently. Um, and sometimes on the bag they'll put um, like e like where it should be every hour and which allows just kind of a quick assessment as to whether or not the bag is uh, in infusing. So infusion control devices are pumps. Um, generally they have alarms when your bag is empty generally that's the rate to be infused has reached zero. Um, if there's air that comes through the cassette or if there's some resistant to the infusion. There are a variety of infusion control devices. In our lab, we have Baxters and Plums. You may have seen other types in your clinical setting. And we will work with these um, also on Thursday. This is just an example of um, a more updated Baxter. So when we have patients receiving IV fluids, we need to take note of the IV therapy currently ordered. We need to verify when we go into the room that the patient has the correct fluid and the correct rate. Um, we want to make sure that the drip chamber is about half full. So this allows us to see that the IV is dripping. We want to make sure our tubing doesn't have any kinks. We want to make sure and check the dates to see if we need to change the tubings or change the bag. And we want to assess the dressing we want to note the date that the IV was inserted um, and make sure per policy we don't need to change that site. Um, and we should assess it at least every four hours and we will assess it each time we give a medication or we do any changes to the IV fluids. So this is just one uh, particular way in which tubings are changed. Primaries depending on policy or in secondaries are changed every three to four days. Um, blood and blood products, those are uh, changed depending per policy and we'll talk about blood products and blood components. I, there's a lecture coming up. Um, if we give IV fat replacements, generally we change those every 24 hours. TPN, the tubing is changed um, every, at St. Joe's, it's changed with every bag change. So every 24 hours we change hours. So if we're going to terminate the IV therapy or take the uh, IV out, we're going to use gloves, we're going to stop the fluid, we're going to remove the tape and dressing. We'll gently apply pressure with the dry gauze pad and we'll remove the cannula, keeping it parallel to the skin. And we'll um, dispose of that needle or catheter according to the hospital standard uh, precautions guidelines. We may elevate the extremity and apply pressure. We're going to secure the gauze with tape and we're going to record or document the appearance of the site, the condition of the catheter, such as was it bent, was the tip intact, um, and then how the patient tolerated the procedure. So these are just when we might have to change devices. Um, this says short peripheral cannulas and tubings are usually changed every 48 to 72 hours. We don't change the site every 48 to 72 hours, um, but we will change our tubing. Pick lines can be uh, in for about six weeks, and you just need to review the policy of where you um, live or work. So some documentation. Okay, again. Precautions, always remember that there is a risk of exposure to bloodborne pathogens um, and that there are numerous products for venipuncture or IV therapy that can reduce the risk of needle puncture. So 
we are all getting better about protecting ourselves for we can have accidental needle sticks so if we do please report that right away um, there are some complications we can have uh, complications from the v the actual device the fluids or the medications and they can occur either locally at the insertion site or systemically we can have infiltration when the it moves into the tissue um, and some causes of is dislodgement or we perforate the vein so treatment is removal of the dice device and then we need to reassess whether the patient needs to have a new site placed in patient can get phlebitis which is an inflammation of the vein and we remove the device and manage the symptoms of the phlebitis they can get an infection same thing we remove the site if the patient has a symptomatic infection um, we might send the tip of the device to the lab to culture and they may need antipyretics or anti-fever agents and antibiotics. Another thing that can happen is uh, estravization, which is when the, uh, it moves into the vein or the tissue. And um, so this is important because we will have drugs that uh, cause necrosis of tissue. Uh, Dilantin is one specifically. So um, before we were to ever give a drug like Dilantin, we'd want to make sure our site had not infiltrated. We push these drugs slowly and watch the site. If we do get extravasation, we have to stop the drug and uh, document the procedure. So some others include hematomas, vasospasm, occlusion, or discomfort. So we could have some systematic complications, fluid overload. And we about these a little bit in fluid and electrolytes. We can have an allergic reaction. We can get an air embolus when the air enters the bloodstream. And what is our responsibility? We need to be aware of complications. We need to assess our patient and their IV site frequently. Um, we need to document, teach, and reassure our patients. We need to understand medications and IV fluids risks and benefits and always, always never give anything you are unfamiliar with. We'll talk briefly about TPN. So TPN is total parental nutrition. It's a hypertonic solution and it's designed so the patient can get its total nutritional needs met. Generally, these are given uh, centrally, either through a PIC or a CVC or an implanted port. Usually we begin TPN slowly and then increase it over time and this allows the pancreas to adjust to the high glucose level of the uh, intravenous fluid itself. There are complications assorted with TPN such as infection, embolism, and fluid overload. Um, because of the high level of dextrose in TPN, patients can develop hyperglycemia. Patients can also develop rebound hypoglycemia when TPN solution is abruptly discontinued. Um, if there are patients who can do limited oral intake, they may get peripheral parenteral nutrition, which can be given through a peripheral vein. Um, its amount of uh, ingredients are at lower concentrations, and therefore it's able to be uh, infused through a peripheral line. So if we're going to do um, TPN, we have some documentations. We need to know why. We need to include assessment and monitoring. We need to know the date, starting, and ending times of the infusion and secondary nurse verification. We document the TPN or lipid product information, and um, we assess uh, any observations made during the monitoring period. We record INO. We record whether they've had an adverse effect, and we detail that according to facility policy. and. Um, also, TPN can be high risk factor for infections because of the high sugar level. So it's used only when there is no other alternative to provide nutrition. So we just need to make sure laboratory tests are done, that uh, we're looking at patients' fluid, their electrolyte and acid-base balance. We are also measuring their glucoses. Generally, these patients are on Q. Uh, six hour blood sugars and um, we're always measuring their fluid balance and identifying any complications with the infusion. 
This is just a little picture of what is the difference between TPN and PPN. What is the difference? Um, there you go. And that's the end.